Thank you, SME Europe. Uh, Dr. Horst, did you want to say hello first? Yes, I want only shot because we have also not so much time. I think we have to be very brief. Thank you first for the, the Talos Foundation and the Property Rights Alliance for this initiative and the partnership for this webinar. I think it's very important because the consequences are also reaching out for SMEs because it's a box of Pandora if patents are not safe anymore. And uh, I enjoy that we have now in this short time put organize this event. And uh, please, the floor is yours. Thank you again, and I hope we will cooperate also in the future. Thank you, Dr. Horst, and thank you especially to our guest speakers and our distinguished panelists. I know that um, we had such a short time to make this event possible. Over the last year and a half, this uh, waiver for intellectual property rights of items related to COVID-19 vaccines has been in discussion with just four member states. And then only uh, last month uh, was the final text released for um, the rest of the member states and civil society groups to discuss. So we hope in this short amount of time, we can uh, further that discussion to help the groups uh, understand the waiver and to help them decide on uh, how to support it or not. And to start us off, we have from the two halves of the Oxford and AstraZeneca vaccine, from the UK, we have Lord James Bethel of Romford, and then from Sweden, Minister of European Parliament, Jorgen Warborn. Um, they'll give their reactions to the COVID-19 uh, uh, waiver at the, under discussion at the WTO. And then we'll continue that discussion with our panelists, John O'Connell from the Taxpayers Alliance, Matthew Lesh from the Institute of Economic Affairs, and Professor Cesar Galli from the University of Parma, where he's chair of IP law. So without further ado, here is uh, Lord James Bethel. He's the former minister and current member of the House of Lords. And as Minister for Innovation uh, and the Department of Health and Social Care, he helped lead the UK's response to the COVID epidemic. Welcome, uh, James Bethel. Thank you very much indeed. And if I can just kick off by saying this, there's a lot around our vaccine uh, capability uh, in this world that needs to be changed. There's work that needs to be done on our clinical trials and sharing of clinical tri uh, trial uh, data. Uh, there needs to be um, big changes in the way in which vaccines are procured. The supply chains around uh, the components of vaccines need to be rationalized and made more resilient. Capacity in, uh, in country needs to be addressed and I welcome changes that are happening in South Africa on that. Uh, and the, just the, the amount of public health capacity in country needs to be invested in. But the idea that the answer to the world's vaccine problems is to waive the IP around vaccines is just completely wrong. It is mumbo jumbo economics and takes us down the wrong track. And so for that reason, I am an opponent of uh, a blanket waiver. Uh, I know from my own experience that the motivation of uh, vaccine development companies and the nimble and agile way in which they brought huge amounts of investment capacity to bear on this acute uh, human challenge was absolutely remarkable. And any efforts to undermine the financial arrangements uh, uh, around that system would be utterly counterproductive. Counterproductive not just to the developed world who pay for the far, the far largest proportion of this investment, but also uh, to the economic south who are enormous beneficiaries from differential price, pricing regimes. And we should be looking at those differential pricing regimes rather than the undermining uh, of intellectual property. I'm very happy to leave my comments at that. Thank you, James. And uh, then we'll go to uh, Mr. Warborn. He's the, in the Committee of International Trade and the Committee of uh, Tourism and Transportation. Uh, go ahead, Jorgen Warborn. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I uh, I started working with IP issues when I was part uh, when I was a member of the national parliament back home in Sweden, and I can see that uh, Horst is is actually in Stockholm at the moment. At that time, we had issues with uh, mainly with copyright issues because uh, there was a lot of theft 
um, going on uh, when it comes to copyrights. And I think it is very problematic that we, at that time we had, it, it, it was clearly theft when you, when you steal someone's copyright. And now it seems like we will have a, a, a state offered theft in a way. We're giving away the property of companies' research. And I, of course, I oppose this, this idea. I think it is very important to, to strengthen the intellectual property rights. I mean, we are in an economy that is based on knowledge and creativity, and then we cannot uh, make the intellectual property less worth. And that is what will happen. We have a growth issue in Europe. We are not, um, we are not uh, growing as much as other uh, uh, countries around the world. And that will hurt our prosperity at the end of the day. And this, so this is, this is important, of course, for future pandemics, but this is important for the prosperity of the Europeans and the world, I would argue, as well. And therefore, I argue that we should have a growth summit in Europe to focus on how we can restart the economy, how we can create more jobs, and how we can create more growth. So that, that should be within the European Union, a growth summit and IP issues should be at the core of that kind of discussion. As a member of the European, Part of me, European Parliament and as a member of the uh, Committee on International Trade, I voted no for the TRIPS waiver. It is very unfortunate, of course, that the Parliament, uh, that there is a majority in the European Parliament for this idea. Uh, then, of course, we had the four, uh, uh, four uh, uh, members of WTO, EU, US, South Africa, and, um, and India, who decided to go forward with this idea. I'm quite, I, I was opposed to the idea. I was quite surprised that US backed this idea. Uh, and, but I've understood that now, no one of these fours are pro uh, their idea. It's the idea of a TRIPS waiver is basically an orphan. No one would like to take care of it at this moment, which of course is good. Uh, the main criticism of the trade TRIPS waiver I have, well, it's twofold. First of all, we do not have a produ produ production problem. We have massive number of vaccines. We have a distribution problem. And you cannot solve a distribution problems with a TRIPS waiver. The second part is probably even more harmful because if you make the property rights less worth, it will mean less incentives to, to invest in research and developments for pharmacy companies in the future. And that will be problematic for future pandemics. I'd like to end with saying that I am happy that it is, it, so this is these four com countries or EU is not country, but still, it's these four members of the WTO that uh, are, are are, are pushing this a bit. And I'm really happy that UK and Switzerland seems for me to be very strong, uh, strongly against this. I will go to Geneva to the ministerial conference on Sunday, and I will make sure uh, to do my best part. This is up to the ministers, of course, to make sure that this will never happen because it is a very bad idea. Thank you very much. Thanks for addressing growth, uh, Mr. Warborn, and also for James Bethel and your comments about uh, innovation. I want to ask uh, Mr. Bethel, while we still have you, one of the arguments for the waiver is that um, without these intellectual property barriers, and sometimes they're called, that developing countries would be able to uh, leapfrog in their innovation capacity. And, uh, but for the UK, especially that, the pharmaceutical industry stepped full in and into using all their resources to fight the pandemic uh, and contributed to quite a few uh, vaccine candidates. What's the role of uh, intellectual property rights in allowing that innovation capacity to exist? And uh, is there any weight behind uh, the argument that removing them might help uh, countries uh, be prepared for the next pandemic? Uh, what an interesting question. Listen, that wasn't my experience. It is true that 
what happens in developing countries does have a really valuable contribution to innovation, but it happens, generally speaking, at an earlier stage of the development cycle. That's where the clinical trials, uh, the um, uh, analysis of what is happening, where the disease is being spread, uh, it's where the uh, scientists and epidemiologists are looking at the spread of the disease. These are all critically uh, important parts of the scientific process. It's not necessarily where the laboratories are based. The idea that waiving intellectual property rights will somehow create uh, the building of um, sophisticated laboratories in areas that don't have the ecosystem for um, high-end scientific research seems to me one that's worth challenging. And then uh, one last follow-up question, and I'll also ask it to uh, Mr. Warborn. On the politics behind the wa waiver, he mentioned that it's been the four countries called the Quad, the US, the EU, uh, India, and South Africa that have taken the lead on uh, negotiating this informally. Uh, but left out of that was the UK. Uh, and now the UK, because of Brexit, has the ability to uh, make its own vote at the World Trade Organization. Uh, is it a mistake to leave out the UK in part of those earlier negotiations? And will the UK feel uh, confident uh, being one of those few countries uh, standing against the waiver at the moment? Do you want me to start? Uh, sure. And also, uh, Mr. Warburn, of those four countries, the EU is, has been the only one that has endorsed the waiver. As you say, it's mostly an orphan. They've made this compromise, but none of the uh, India, South Africa, uh, or the US have endorsed it. But for some reason, the, the European Union has said they support it for the sake of making progress at the WTO. Well, I think, uh, you know, I think it, uh, the, the ministerial conference is uh, not set to make a lot of progress. I think and I hope that we will make some progress. Uh, there are negotiations on fisheries subsidies, there are negotiations on agriculture, there are negotiations on e-commerce issues, there are negotiations on reform of the WTO as such, and there are negotiations on response to the pandemic. The, the issue of the TRIPS waiver will paralyze the negotiation on and response to the pandemic. I think we should take that part out and make a response to the pandemic with other issues. And there are other issues, not least the export restrictions that some countries are using. We need more trade. We need more we need to be able to source products from different countries and therefore a, a, a solution within the WTO would be very beneficial for this pandemic and for future pandemics, but it can never include a TRIPS waiver because that will be a slippery slope downhill uh, that will make problems for future pandemics. So we need to strengthen the IP rights uh, to create prosperity, jobs uh, and, and more patterns. Uh, and for the UK uh, and Switzerland are the strongest uh, proponents on this idea. But there, of course, are 164 members in the WTO. And it, it is enough if one country uh, decides to vote against, because, uh, as you know, WTO is a, an organization that uh, decides unanimously. So I hope that we will have a solution uh, without the TRIPS waiver. Thank you, Warborn. Uh... Lord Bethel had to had a previous engagement. He had to cut his time time short. That was uh, pre-planned. So uh, I want to introduce now the rest of our uh, panelists and invite Mr. Warborn to continue as long as uh, you can. From the UK, we have Matthew Lesh, head of public policy at the Institute for Economic Affairs, and then John O'Connell, the executive director of Taxpayers Alliance, and then Professor Caesar Galley from the University of Parma, where he's chair of IPN Law. Uh, if we might, if you mind, don't mind, we'll start with John uh, with uh, Matthew Lesh, and if each of you can give a short two minutes of your reaction to the waiver, and then we'll have a discussion. Go ahead, uh, Matthew Lesh. Yeah, sure. Thank you uh, very much for the invitation. I mean, I think the, the discussion so far has been uh, quite interesting and, and fascinating. I, I very much echo many of those points. I mean, I'd say at a fundamental level. Um, we can't underplay the extraordinary achievement 
of the COVID-19 vaccines um, in terms of the, the opportunities they now give us. These, these um, vaccine platforms, um, in a sense, give us for, for the first time in human history a way to overcome pestilence. And the fact that we can now effectively vary with rapid speed, plug and play um, these, these vaccine, using these vaccine platforms. Um, and, and hopefully if we can spin up the regulatory process, get them to market much faster. But that didn't just happen out of thin air, that happened out of huge investments over many years um, by, these, uh, by these companies and universities um, and individuals who many thought uh, and, and laughed at for a long time and thought that something like an mRNA vaccine uh, wasn't uh, a viable prospect whatsoever. And I think that speaks a lot to the process of discovery. Um, m most discoveries, most medical innovations um, and, and attempts at innovating fail um, and are hugely expensive process. Um, and they very much um, need the ability to, when they succeed, um, to be profitable. Uh, the, the fact is, be before COVID-19, um, the amount of money spent on vaccines was, was less than that spent on alternative medicine, things like homeopathy. Um, it wasn't a particularly profitable entity. And arguably, there was, um, up until this point, an underinvestment um, in vaccines, con considering the, the potential risk of pandemics. I think we now have, the, for the first time, a, a potentially massively profitable industry for vaccine innovation and vaccine development. Um, and that's a very welcome development. Um, unfortunately, though, of course, the, the TRIPS waiver will undermine that process by the fact that um, it will disincentivize anyone from continuing to invest um, heavily in these platforms. It will discourage people from developing new vaccine platforms, um, from putting the money in that it takes to run through uh, various stages of clinical trials, um, as well as the uh, regulatory process. So I, I think at a fundamental level is extremely concerning uh, to be undermining property rights in this manner. Now, I'm very much open to the idea that um, potentially patents or some copyright runs for too long. I'm very much open to the idea that, uh, you know, the existing system isn't perfect uh, and that there would be other ways we could encourage innovation. But I'd say that uh, an entire waiver of this nature makes very little sense um, on, the, on the fact of long-term consequences. But what seems even more extraordinary, of course, is the fact that as far as we can tell, there isn't really a global vaccine shortage that this will solve. Um, there's not a, an array of capable manufacturing capacity that remains unused. There aren't a lack of vaccines, there's a lack of logistics to get those vaccines around the world. And that's simply a matter of dealing with those issues on the ground. I think it probably speaks to the fact that we get, we get this a lot, I think in, in policy world, is we have an idea in our mind and we think it's gonna solve all these problems without actually thinking through the practicalities on the ground. And just because you say patents are gone, doesn't mean you suddenly solve the issue of uh, vaccine access, but it's just the assumption is made just by saying you can solve it. Um, I would also point to the unintended, potential unintended consequences in terms of um, how many, uh, how many, I suppose, you know, directly, not necessarily authorized vaccine manufacturers do you want? And what is the potential risk when it comes to vaccine safety of having additional manufacturers that aren't necessarily um, authorized or aren't, aren't necessarily um, looked over as closely by the original creators of the vaccines? And to what extent could a dangerous vaccine uh, developed by a third party actually increase the risk of people not being willing to take vaccines? I think that's another big risk there. But I think I might just leave it there at those particular thoughts. Thanks, Matt. And uh, thanks for talking about risk and how uh, intellectual property rights can incentivize uh, investment when there are risks. I was reminded when you're talking that uh, in the US, at least, we had about 30 vaccine candidates, but only two have been approved so far. And uh, before we, any of them were approved, we were thinking if they're just 60% or 70% effective, it would be a good thing. But it turned out in record amount of time, uh, we had two vaccines that were 95% effective, uh, thanks to the intellectual property environment. Now I want to go to Professor Caesar Galley and uh, try to keep it within two minutes on your initial reactions to uh, uh, the waiver. First of all, thanks a lot for this uh, uh, great event. I strongly support the uh, previous uh, uh, um, uh, speech uh, because in turn, I believe that uh, uh, the real enemies in this battle against uh, COVID are bureaucracy, inefficiency, especially in the distribution chain in the developing countries and political mediations and not patent. Without intellectual property, uh, what the bottom would 
break out, uh, in which not the best would win, but uh, those who have the political protection to operate without responsibility in the event of failure, as is already happening in Russia or China, with results that are certainly not reassuring, as it is proven by the uh, um, excess uh, death uh, during the two years of pandemic that cannot lie. Uh, the national government may say we have few uh, uh, deaths for COVID by the data on the excess of deaths uh, uh, are uh, crystal clear, I believe. What really matters is creating competition between innovators, which in fact uh, there already has been, as uh, uh, my uh, uh, co-panelists already stressed, uh, with multiple vaccines using different technologies. And so the market generates more choice, even satisfying different needs. But please think about the uh, issues of conservation of vaccines uh, that may be helpful in a different kind of countries, lower cost and more quality, uh, because they will compete for market share. Uh, I would like to introduce a further issue that I think it's extremely important against the waiver. It is the argument of licenses which for instance uh, have already been granted and from the very beginning, uh, Moderna uh, uh, um, I, uh, said it was willing to grant. Uh, uh, licenses are the ideal solution when demand exceeds supply, uh, but uh, requires the identification of production sites and the collaborative approach to regulatory compliance which requires burdensome validation processes for compelling safety reasons. Uh, there is no uh, reason for thinking that uh, through the waiver, we will improve the production of uh, uh, vaccines. Instead, these uh, uh, working with innovators and encouraging them through the remuneration that patent exclusivities guarantees them would be the best solution in such a situation. Above all, it is necessary to have the vision of the future that in many cases has been lacking uh, so far and regretfully, not only in the war on pandemics as the uh, uh, Russia-Ukraine uh, situation uh, uh, clearly shows. A mutant virus such as COVID is likely to last a long time, forcing us to vaccinate several times and with improved vaccines. We therefore need to steadily increase vaccine research, vaccine innovation, and vaccine production capacity worldwide, working with innovators and encouraging them through the remuneration that patent exclusivity guarantees them. So with a view to better protecting the right to health, which is also a constitutional rights in many European countries, including Italy, the waiver is not a shortcut. It's a, a, a dead end. Thank you, Professor Galli, and for introducing also uh, the need for future vaccines and probably strain-specific vaccines and for uh, the concept of licensing agreements, which exist in India and South Africa for COVID-19 vaccines. Uh, next, let's go to John O'Connell from the Taxpayers Alliance on your reactions to the TRIPS waiver. All right, thank you, Philip, and um, thank you for having me this morning. It's, it's kind of strange. I was in Stockholm just yesterday and I had to come home, but you're there this morning, so um, I should have stayed on an extra day. But um, on, on to the issue at hand. Um, it feels to me that we're trying to solve a problem that doesn't necessarily exist. I mean, there's already been 13 billion doses of vaccine administered in over 180 countries. Um, annual production capacity is going to reach 24 billion doses in June um, uh, this year. Um, so that's, an, that's more than enough to achieve the WHO's call to vaccinate 70% of the world's population and provide boosters. So it seems to me that um, if there are other problems, such as in supply or manufacture, then we should, or manufacturing, then we should look to solve those problems rather than, you know, um, looking at things like um, an IP waiver. Um, 
I think uh, from the UK's perspective specifically, um, it seems that it's going to be it's probably the first WTO ministerial in which the UK can vote um, uh, alone as, as opposed to apart from the EU bloc. And, and perhaps this time it will have an opportunity to defend its interests as Lord Bethel has already set out rather than having to take an EU position imposed by the Commission. So given that again has already been said that the initiatives at the WTO can only pass by universal consent and since we could and maybe should uh, be blocking um, this one then it's, uh, it seems to me politically at least at home in the UK to be another clear um, benefit of leaving the European Union um, as you know it's allowing the UK to defend its industries and defend its interests and um, there are opportunities available from leaving the EU. I was talking to some friends in um, Stockholm who uh, you know, not particularly happy that the, Britain have left the EU, but there are opportunities uh, available to us. And it's about time um, we started taking them. Um, and, and, you know, just to, just to wrap up, I think there's been some excellent points. Um, Jorgen Warburn in particular was talking about a focus on growth, jobs, innovation. These are the kinds of things that will solve these big problems for us um you know uh, making sure that the stuff that groups like our group the, the institute for economic affairs um you know, groups like yours philip the, the stuff that we advocate for it works and when the big challenges come um private sector innovation um you know um allowing you know, businesses to flourish and grow and and creating more jobs all of that stuff works when the big challenges arise and it's worked um now and we don't need anything like a, a trips waiver to to move it along. Thanks, John. And let me ask you and uh, Matthew Lesh, uh, coming from the UK, uh, since you mentioned uh, this, uh, because of Brexit, now the UK can uh, vote on its own at the World Trade Organization. How important is uh, this TRIPS waiver positioning the UK and the post-Brexit economy? As you mentioned, is it uh, it's uh, intellectual property helps incentivize growth, and the uh, IP environment. Uh, does uh, keeping intellectual property rights part of uh, the Brexit, uh, the post-Brexit economy, is it part of uh, uh, driving a new direction for the UK economy and the pharmaceutical sector? Um, shall I, I'll, I'll jump in. Um, it, it, it should be. Um, I think that, um, unfortunately, the government in the UK has been tied up in, in all sorts of other um, uninteresting priorities. And I think that um, having a proper post-Brexit plan, um, we haven't yet taken the full opportunities of leaving the EU um, such as they are. And a proper post-Brexit plan would in, should involve um, you know, a proper robust uh, defence of intellectual property rights going forward. Absolutely. And you know, even sort of nakedly politically, it's something that the government could and should be talking about in order to demonstrate to the electorate that they made the, the right call, as it were, to leave the European Union back in 2016. Yeah, I mean, I can concur with uh, John there. It hasn't necessarily been a part of public debate in the UK. Um, it is probably on the more technical side of policy making. Um, there has been some discussion, although it hasn't been completely um, uh, figured out yet about medical tech and regulation issues. There's certainly a lot of interest in the industry um, and associated with that intellectual property um, as an opportunity of Brexit. But, but as John said, there's the actual policy work to take advantage of that um, is still forthcoming. Thanks. And now uh, I'll ask a few questions and anybody uh, can jump in to answer. Uh, Matt, you mentioned the regulatory environment, also Professor Galley, and on the, the regulatory institutions in developing countries. Um, what I want to ask is, uh, improving that regulatory environment is part of the innovation ecosystem. And Matt, you suggested, uh, in the UK at least, perhaps there's a way to approve vaccines sooner. And Professor Galley, you mentioned that in the developing world, especially on enforcement of uh, when there is a vaccine or pharmaceutical to making sure uh, it's a legitimate and not a fake or counterfeit or mislabeled uh, product. It should be part of uh, the innovation ecosystem. How does the waiver improve that environment or does it harm that environment, the regulatory environment? 
Well, uh, for sure, I believe that uh, uh, sustainable growth, in order to remain, uh, not remain a utopia, as uh, sometimes it seems to be, and not to result in a waste of resources, must necessarily make use of the tools of the market, and in particular of intellectual property. Therefore, the waiver, as it discourages uh, investment in innovation, and what is more, discourage the use of the patents system and instead suggest that we can, uh, for instance, uh, uh, use uh, uh, trade secrets, especially when it comes to uh, 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 productive methods, which are, uh, uh, by the way, extremely important in, uh, in, in the production of vaccines and or in general in the production of uh, pharmaceuticals, uh, would uh, uh, result in a slowing down of the innovation and what is more of the uh, um, um, distribution of information on innovation. When I file a patent in 18 months, the, 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 the patent application is published, including the disclosure of uh, all the uh, discoveries, ideas, uh, uh, examples uh, underlying that. And these ideas, even if there is an exclusive right on the uh, exploitation of the patent, are uh, public domain. Anyone in the world may use them to make further innovation and even to uh, 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 produce uh, uh, depending innovations and for, e for instance, uh, improvements. And by the way, also the TRIPS agreement provides for compulsory license for the uh, uh, depending patents uh, which are uh, which needs uh, for their exploitation to uh, the uh, exploitation also of the preceding patent when they uh, result in a, 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 an important development of uh, relevance uh, uh, from the economic point of view. Perhaps uh, this rule should be uh, reconsidered in order to uh, encourage depending innovation. Instead, uh, uh, the patent protection represents a fundamental incentive to create new technical solution that respond to felt needs now the COVID, but also the uh, uh, transition uh, to the uh, ecological systems that all of us uh, want, uh, because uh, uh, having new technologies compatible for the protection with the protection of the environment and the future of the world, uh, it's uh, 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 incentivated when we allow the patentee to profit from the results of its research uh, through the exclusive right and uh, in the presence of widespread needs such as environmental one, we have the interest in exploiting mm, through the granting of license, including generalized one, as typically happens for patents that become the standard of a given sector. Now we know that the standard essential patents are particularly important in the electronic domain, but uh, there is no reason for not thinking that it can happen also with uh, 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 innovations in the pharmaceutical domain and uh, in the environmental domain when it is economically justified. And only the market and what is more, only the patent system may give us the opportunity of doing so. Let's think of uh, uh, creative commons in the uh, uh, copyright domain. Exactly the existence of copyright made it possible to uh, uh, provide for these schemes of uh, contractual agreements concerning uh, uh, the open source innovation, like it is for patents. Thanks, for, thanks Professor Gali. And thanks for mentioning compulsory licenses, which is one of the TRIPS flexibilities that allow uh, it's one of a few uh, uh, open to especially developing economies. If intellectual property rights are ever in the way of uh, access to a medicine, there are these flexibilities that allow them to 
uh, overcome those uh, intellectual property uh, rights. Uh, one of the original arguments for the waiver was that those flexibilities are complicated and time consuming. And so what was argued by India and South Africa is this uh, blanket waiver uh, to overstep, uh, go over uh, the specific uh, regulations. Is there, now we've been two years into the pandemic, but no country has actually initiated a compulsory license for a COVID vaccine. Uh, does that uh, undermine that original argument for the waiver or is there some truth to that the process for using flexibilities is uh, overly complicated? Uh, frankly speaking, it is not. Uh, the European Patent Office made a very interesting uh, study, uh, which is uh, publicly available indeed, uh, according to which the European country that in emergency situation is uh, uh, more open to the grant of compulsory licenses without any red tape is Germany. Uh, nevertheless, also in Germany, no kind of compulsory licenses have been uh, requested. Uh, in, uh, actually, the mechanism of uh, the TRIPS agreement in this respect allows the countries in case of emergency, by the way, not only in case of uh, 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 health emergency, emergency in general, to be extremely flexible in the grant of compulsory license. But what is the real problem? What is really matters? That uh, uh, manufacturing vaccines is difficult is not so easy as the sponsors of the waiver think or mm, let think. Uh, what really matters is uh, uh, create the culture of intellectual property. And only through the culture of intellectual property, the huge investments that are necessary for establishing the plants for producing uh, uh, pharmaceuticals uh, are uh, made uh, possible. Please consider that Italy produces about 52% of all the pharmaceuticals sold in Europe. And we have some companies that works on vaccine, on manufacturing vaccines uh, upon licenses granted, uh, not in the case of COVID indeed, uh, COVID vaccines, but there are many other vaccines granted by the companies. Why? Because they made relevant investments for creating the, 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 the protective plants and they're motivated to do so exactly from the fact that through the license and the relevant exclusive right, they would have been able to profit from their investments in the plants. Likewise, I think that uh, what is really important is, for instance, uh, the uh, Quad project that was made by United States, Japan, uh, uh, Australia, and India for uh, 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 producing and distributing vaccines in Asia, which was undermined exactly by the situation, the dramatic situations in India that concentrated its productive resources, by the way, uh, upon license indeed uh, for producing vaccine for the internal market. And on the other side, we we'll think about the COVAX program of the uh, uh, United Nations and other uh, uh, public and private uh, 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 international organizations that again did not work uh, with the idea of the waiver, but instead with an idea of uh, uh, improving the production, improving the distribution systems. That are the real strategic issues and the waiver uh, would have a negative impact on that. And what is more, it could have even a negative impact on the quality and uh, uh, safety of the vaccines. That's a great problem that the waiver, these, uh, the waiver supporters, I mean, do not consider at all. And by the way, also many developing countries uh, uh, look like not to consider. What really matters is improving 
these underlying aspects. By the way, please consider that we have the, the vaccines against COVID in a very short time. Unbelievable. The first time ever we had vaccines in a so short time. Why? Because many previous research and patents, especially about the RNA messenger technology, had been granted due to previous research and due to the uh, incentive deriving from the patent system. Thanks, Professor Galli. You covered a lot of ground there and especially highlighting the if there is a waiver, the real next step is in manufacturing, which is the complicated part. I want to ask uh, Mr. of European Parliament, Jorgen Warborn, before he has to leave, about the European Union's uh, support for the waiver for the sake of progress at the WTO, if that is short sighted, especially considering that Europe has been a powerhouse of uh, pharmaceutical innovation. Uh, and does that jeopardize that innovation if uh, the waiver goes forward? And if you have any closing remarks as well. Well, as I think I've been very clear, I, I do not support it, uh, but uh, there are others and the parliament supports this and the co uh, commission supports it. I think you're right in your question that uh, one of the reasons is that they see that this change is, is the best possible deal they can get it maybe it doesn't mean anything in practical terms my concern is that it will send the wrong signals um, maybe the commission argue that there are other issues that are also important when it comes to international trade i mentioned the fisheries subsidies the agriculture um, negotiations, the negotiations on e-commerce, the WTO reform in itself, not least uh, the fact that we do not have a, 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 an appellate body that is working. Uh, so there are rules, but there are no one that could look after the rules. Uh, maybe one, they argue that they, we will have to make some concessions in order to get issues on other negotiations. Um, it will be problematic uh, if we send that signal, I think. And I understand that there is no appetite in the US from any stakeholders, uh, even though the administration has negotiated this together with the other three. Uh, so I think and hope that it will be uh, dead on arrival in Geneva, uh, so to speak, and that we will be able to uh, focus on other issues this very important week in terms of international trade. Uh, let me just uh, finish off by saying thank you very much for uh, making this uh, initiative to have this discussion. It was really useful with a lot of knowledge uh, from the panelists. Uh, I, did, uh, I did get a, a lot of new arguments and a, a lot of new inputs and, and thank you very much for, for Property Rights Alliance and of course to, uh, to SME Europe uh, and Horst. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Warborn. Uh, I want to take up that point on uh, what do we take away from this uh, pandemic and I'm reflecting on what happened in the United States with our uh, warp speed program that allowed uh, companies to produce uh, millions of vaccines uh, before they were approved. And uh, I wanna ask uh, Matt and John, if, uh, if there's other things like that that we should be taking away from this pandemic rather than focusing on uh, intellectual property rights. Uh, yeah, so I mean, I, I think Operation World Seed and, and, and similar programs uh, in the UK uh, and Europe were, were certainly necessary um, and welcome during COVID. It's interesting that uh, there were different parts to it. So some parts of Operation Warp Speed um, provided the money for the research and development, uh, while others, other parts of it were simply the advanced purchase orders so that the, the companies would know that um, whether or not their vaccine was ultimately successful, that there'd be a, a buyer of the vaccine. I think in the unique circumstances of COVID and the traditional kind of economics of vaccine development, it was necessary because there were otherwise um, there, there simply wouldn't have been the cash available um, for to, to basically do the um, 
uh, manufacturing at the same time as the research development before because usually you, you wouldn't want to go into manufacturing until you knew that uh, the vaccine was actually effective. I'm, I'm not sure whether you'd want to repeat that exact same model for other vaccines or other medicines just because um, you don't necessarily know, you don't necessarily have such a high value proposition for every single medicine that you want to start manufacturing prior to whether or not you know it's effective. I think what you could probably think about though is, you know, what could be the potential benefit of something like prizes um, in particular cases where you, you have a, a goal that you want to achieve. Let's say you want a vaccine for a certain um, outcome. You provide a prize to ensure that, that the companies have an incentive to create it. Um, you, you think about the regulatory process, I think is probably even more important here. How, how did we manage to do the regulatory process so quickly? A process normally takes years and years and years. And that was more or less by doing the different stages simultaneously um, of regulatory approval. So, so to what extent can, can we speed up the regulatory process more, more generally um, so that other medicines can, can benefit from this kind of speed and, and access to market? So we apply that to other medicines as well. Thanks. I imagine at this moment, there's uh, because of the pandemic, there's a lot of uh, regular ordinary people that are waking up to the regulatory process. And probably there's other parents like me who have kids that are under five and are wondering why vaccines are not approved for them, but approved for adults and, uh, and why that process takes so long. Um, I want to ask, uh, we covered a lot of ground uh, during this uh, webinar already. I don't, I can't tell from here if there's questions from uh, the online world, if there are people that have uh, questions or if uh, other of the panelists want to give uh, closing remarks on the TRIPS waiver. Um, Philip, if you don't mind, I'll just jump in um, to sure. offer um, an additional thought on what Matt was just talking about. Um, the, the, the vaccine task force in the UK, the VTF, was set up in April 2020, and it was to sort of bring together all the different stakeholders, government, academia, industry, et cetera, et cetera. But crucially, the, the, the thing with the VTF, it, it, it sort of bypassed the usual strictures of, of bureaucracy. And um, as Matt said, yes, you might need to take that on a case by case basis, whether to apply that in the future. Um, but one thing's for sure, it worked. Um, stepping outside the usual bureaucracy of the civil service um, uh, made sure um, that we were able to deliver a vaccine program in, 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 in pretty, pretty quick order. So um, applying that model in future would be a good idea. Matt came up with some other ideas such as prizes. Um, but what all of those ideas indicate is that is if, in order to get some stuff done quickly, sometimes you have to step outside um, the normal process of getting things through the civil service in the UK, which can really gum up the process. So I would just sort of second what Matt said about, um, you know, making sure we can apply those models in the future where necessary and sort of on a case by case basis. But um, and then just to close, um, um, you know, um, more generally, um, of course, I'll, I'll repeat something I said earlier, that it's a real opportunity for the UK to sort of plant a flag um, and say, we're, we're pro-growth, we're pro-intellectual property, and, and we're going to um, defend our interests in the upcoming discussions. Thanks, John. Uh, I remember from watching from the US saying that uh, vaccines were approved earlier in the UK, and we were watching on the news the first people receiving their AstraZeneca vaccine. Uh, it gave a lot of hope to uh, the rest of the world. I think another area of improvement is on the, uh, that regulatory uh, coherence and uh, the possibility that uh, once vaccines are approved that uh, other countries can just accept the same approval instead of uh, make up uh, regulations on the spot or their other advisory boards. And, uh, but we can contrast that with what and the advanced purchases with what happened in other countries where there were no advanced purchases, uh, especially in India. Uh, when uh, the pandemic started hitting India, the uh, Serum Institute there was uh, busy exporting vaccines and had to announce on TV that the government had not ordered uh, vaccines for its own country and they had to shut down those exports. Uh, to use uh, those vaccines domestically before they could export again. Uh, Dr. Uh, Galli, do you have closing remarks? 
Well, may I spend uh, just some words on the role of patents uh, uh, for SMEs? Uh, please consider that a, a great industry has a market power that uh, uh, permits it uh, to uh, get rid of competition uh, uh, at some extent. Instead, for SMEs, the real possibility of having a reserved area for uh, exploiting their activity and innovation is exactly intellectual property. That's true for trademark, for design, for copyright, but it's extremely true for uh, patents. Of course, also SMEs may think not to uh, uh, exploit their patents uh, directly, but through the grant of license and even through the uh, 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 assignment of such patents, for instance, out of their core business in order to get resources for improving their activity. And in this respect, I would like to point out also another issue which is extremely important at the present time. You know that uh, this year, thanks God, we are uh, at the end of the day implementing the uh, 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 unitary uh, patent system and the unified patent court systems. That will be made it possible uh, uh, make it possible to uh, 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 patent uh, 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 in a single way and with a single title effective all over the European Union or rather the countries that joined the uh, 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 enhanced cooperation on that uh, uh, without the need of litigating country by country. It's a great innovation but at the same time is a great opportunity for SMEs. Uh, and uh, I think that they should be encouraged to uh, join this system, also considering the costs of the litigation if we, before the UPC. You know that at present, this litigation may be extremely high for SMEs. And uh, uh, however, the uh, three years program uh, of intellectual property of the European Union is focused exactly on SMEs. I think that it, is, uh, it should be uh, insert on the agenda of the European Union, the reduction of costs for using this system for SMEs. In other words, we need patents, we need innovation, and uh, mostly we need that also SMEs are incentivated to use this system through all the methods that we can use. It's not subsidies, it's uh, opportunities, what we really need to increase. And the patent system and the patent protection system in Europe is the best way for doing so. Thank you so much, Professor Galli, for highlighting the role of SMEs and also the role of licensing agreements and uh, creating that knowledge transfer and upgrading technical capacity and manufacturing capacity abroad. Um, this was an excellent webinar. I've learned so much from uh, all of you, and I want to say thank you.